Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to All Together, the Family Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode. Now, as we reach the holiday season with children off school and families gathering together, there can be a number of challenges families face in its usual routine. Everyone in close quarters, different celebratory traditions and cultures that sort of amongst families. Today, we're gonna be looking into how to handle these situations and find some compromises that can help make it easier for all family members involved. To help me in this conversation is clinical psychologist and PhD candidate, Sarah Lee. Thank you so much for joining me in the studio today, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, um, Dina and team, for inviting me uh, to this interesting and timely, perhaps, podcast as well. <laughs> it's it's so easy being on the same um, same country as the guests because it's a so lot easier <laughs> to say, oh, great, it's the morning for both of us today. So it's, yes. it's so great to sort of say that. Oh, yes, for sure. (laughs) Now, as a clinical psychologist, what is your role in helping families sort of understand the different dynamics within a family? Uh Um, I think it's I I think my role is about helping people understand um, um, relationships between each other um, and um, helping you know parents understand pers- the perspective um, from from their children, but also for children to sort of understand um, maybe the the perspective from their parents role. And it's not always the the easiest thing. Um, but but I think in terms of um, family dynamics, it's always about communication and opening communication channels and seeing how we can do that. Mm. It's pretty hard to get a teenager to listen to that say oh just listen to what your parents say and just sort of see that perspective a little bit more <laughs> for sure for sure and and a lot of the times it's it's more about listening to their perspective first you know on a, on a one-to-one and mm-hmm. then gently sort of nudging nudging that that along um i think most teenagers just want to be heard um really you know from their perspective hmm. yeah so with that being said, what are some of the most common frustrations that parents and sometimes kids even say when they're trying to find those compromises within a family? Mm-hmm. I think one of the common compromises is around, you know, when, when parents perhaps um, have a certain um, idea of what they'd like to do or what they want their kids to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that sort of doesn't always align um, with their kids or children's um, intentions of what they'd like to do. Um, yeah. yeah. Which, is, which, which is I can totally problem. identify, which is a big <laughs> problem and something that I'm sure everybody can identify with uh, to some extent. Yes, no, I, I definitely agree. I think looking back on childhood, and I know in this show, I probably look back on my childhood far too much, but looking oh. back on it, there's so much that they're wanting for me that I'm not wanting for myself or I'm seeing a different direction or um, I will say that as an adult now, I am glad that they pushed me to get through high school and to finish school oh. and to, otherwise that would be in a mess in figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. So I will say that that is mm-hmm. a benefit for me at, to an extent, but it did for cause sure. me, I, I will say that it did cause me to burn out far too early in life. <laughs> No, no, I hear you. It's sort of like the balance between um, pushing and sort of holding back, isn't it? Um, when is, you know, from the parent's perspective, when is it okay or when does it feel right to sort of push a child um, in a certain area to challenge them sufficiently for growth, but also not too much um, that it sort of burns them out or it's sort of premature growth 
um, that, that that could also be detrimental as well. I think it's a it's a fine balance that always shifts um, yeah. as well. Hey, mm. just another reminder that parenting is difficult. <laughs> but yeah, for sure, for sure, very difficult. Um, and amidst all of the other societal issues and stuff that's sort of in the climate as well, that 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 they're in the mix. Um, parents are humans too, so they also have their own, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that mm. took me about 25 years to learn that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, that is such a great introduction into our topic today, and especially focusing on the holiday seasons. But before we discuss it even further, I would love to get to know some of your interests and some of your recommendations to our audience today by playing our little icebreaker. And it's called Have You Met Sarah Lee? Well, uh, so the first one is, what is a favorite book of yours? Oh, um, I was thinking about that. Um, and it's hard um, because I'm not someone with favorites. Um, I I believe that there there is a book for every occasion, a book for every situation. Um, mm -hmm. And I believe I learn, you know, different things from different books. Um, but if I had to pick one or a couple, um, most, rec <laughs> most recently, um, I read this book called um, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. Uh, and that is by Laurie Gottlieb, um, which is a therapist herself. And she recounts um, really lovely um, her own, um, you know, some insights um, into her, um, her own sessions with her clients but also in relation to her own struggles and her own sessions with her own therapist. And that was really interesting uh, too. Um, so that's one book. Um, the other book I thought I should mention um, is this book called um, What I Mean When I Say I'm Autistic. Um, and that is by Annie Kodowitz, um, who is a late diagnosed autistic um, female. Um, and I really enjoyed reading that book. It was that sort of first hand um, first-hand sort of um, her talking about her own inner experience of autism um, after being late diagnosed and not knowing that she was autistic um, for a long time. So yeah, those are like sort of two books at the moment. Oh, they, that, that... they both sound really fascinating, especially the second one. I think, with, especially with, um, I think we were talking about a little bit earlier before we started recording about the number of neurodivergent children or adults that sort yes. of come into play today and yeah. being late diagnosed must have so many challenges and so many big realizations that sort of come yes. out as you're an mm. adult being like oh that makes sense now for sure for sure um and a lot of um the adult clients i see um they they all describe it as a sense of you know this has always been who i am but at the same time it's also discovering the sort of new way of seeing myself um as well which is sort of challenging um yeah, too, but yeah, mm. no, that's that's a really big, especially in today's day and age when we see it so often where it's more popular now to talk about being neurodivergent than it is to be neurotypical. So there is that yes. huge little differences that we all notice in society today, which I think is great. I will say I think oh. it's a great thing that we're noticing that. So, no, I think yeah. those two books are great recommendations. So thank you for that. Now, all good. What is the most recent movie that you've seen? Um, the most recent um, movie I've seen, um, a little bit late to the game, um, but uh, it's Elemental by Pixar. Um, and I really love that movie. I don't know if you've watched it yet. Uh, I haven't but it's seen an, it yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is wonderful. And I'm not going to spoil it, um, but yeah, it's wonderful. And it has a lot of um, diversity themes um, as okay. well. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. perfect. I, I can't wait. To, I've seen the trailer so many times that I just really want to sit down and just watch it and have that have that um mentality just like okay i need to really just focus on it without focusing on any other thing because yes, yes. that's with me and disney me and disney will never <laughs> i'll never do anything else while watching disney <laughs> no no i hear you it deserves that attention exactly yes 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 so in speaking of that do you have a podcast that you would love to recommend for our viewers today oh yes yes oh uh, well it will not come as a surprise <laughs> but um uh, one of my favorite podcasts um, for a year now um, is called the Neurodiversity Woman Podcast, um, and it's by Monique Mitchelson and um, Shell Levock. And it, um, they they talk about it. One of them, um, I, I believe, uh, Monique is neurodivergent herself, and Michelle uh, comes from a neurotypical perspective. 
and they and they and they're both psychologists and they talk about you know different sort of um um topics um around neurodiversity specifically and you know being a neurodiversity a neurodiverse woman a neurodivergent woman um in this time and age and the challenges um that, that, that come along um, with it. So that's a really interesting um, one that, that, that I've been, yeah, sinking my, my teeth in and recommending to my, my clients as well. Yeah, yeah, that, no, I love, I I love podcasts that sort of deal with that because it shows, I love the show, the dynamic as well, the difference between ah. the both of them and the way that they sort of see the world is completely different. Yes, 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 totally. So, no, that sounds fascinating and I'm definitely adding it to my list of podcasts to listen to when I'm on the train on the way home today. So I'm excited for that. Wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Now, do you have a person that you find yourself looking up to either in your professional or your um, personal life? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. No, for sure. Um, and, you know, when I think about that, um, I think just like books, I don't have just that one. I think I look to many different people for different things. And I am, you know, really grateful to have a lot of um, key support um, role models um, in my professional life. Um, uh, and I think one of them would, you know, be my supervisor, my um, clinical supervisor um, that, that, that um, supervised me in my clinical uh, registrar um, program uh, coming out from my master's. Um, and um, her name is Cassie, uh, and and I see her as, as like a role model, but also like such a warm support um, as as I um, grow in my professional practice. Um, she's really that um, safe haven as a supervisor, um, and we don't always you know get that. So that's that's my that's my role model in my professional life. Oh, that's it's so good when you have different lecturers or different sort of academics or in your corner and sort of helping you along the way because I think nothing is better than having someone who's a little bit a whole lot more experienced in some areas that they can just really rely on and I can definitely relate to that because it's I find myself looking up to a lot of my mentors in university and just yes. sort of looking up to their perspective yeah. and really yeah. taking it to heart when they have some constructive yeah. criticism as well <laughs> but sure because they mean so much to you and and you know because yeah, <laughs> yeah no no exactly. I hear you <laughs> Yeah. So now I know that a family has a very different definition as to what everyone has a very different definition as to what family is to them and yes. how they view family and different dynamics. What would you say your definition of a family is? Oh, uh, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and I like how, you know, you said sort of something like, um, I like how you were saying like everybody has a sort of like a different definition of what a family is because that's really true um, in this time and age. You know, if you were to ask, you know, somebody, you know, what a family is, say maybe 50 or 100 years ago, I imagine they'll have well, roughly the same idea, which is that, you know, traditionally a family is sort of the biological family, the people that, you know, you're related by blood to. Mm -hmm. But if you were to ask me, you know, what my um, definition of a family is, I think it's really whoever you choose to be your family, you know, and that can be blood related or it can not be. It can be people that you choose to have in your life that feel like family. Because I think um, that not everybody is privileged to have, you know, blood related members of the family that make them feel safe. Um, and I think that's, that's really important in this time and yes. No, I agree. And I, I definitely but agree that there is such a big difference between what we used to think about family, what we uh. think about it now. And I, it's it's such a big question. Every time I ask, I'm always amazed <laughs> how similar everyone's answers are with how much Good. the definition of family is and how you don't have to be biologically related to people anymore to sort of see them as no. your family. It's not like, it's not an out of respect thing anymore, like it used to be. Yes. And I, I also love that it has changed because the whole out of respect culture is very uh, different to what it is now like you have to earn respect now rather than you're just sort of yes you demand respect and you're getting it yes or you have yes. to be older and you get respect uh, so there is a huge change in that now for sure and i think i think i love that too this sort of change because it's more values based it's more around 
uh, do these other people share the same values? It's not just a uh, taken for granted and, and, and sort of loses its meaning when it's sort of like I demand respect and I get it kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, which baffles me why it used to be like that, but I'm just glad it changed. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's very fitting with a, a whole lot of argumentative people that we are now. The whole society is argumentative as a whole now, I think, in terms of if you don't value me, then I'm not going to value you. Like there is a whole mm. give and take to it now than there used to be. For sure. So, especially For sure. when it comes to parent and child relationships, I think now a lot of parents having to earn the respect of a child rather than just saying, I'm your parent, so you have to listen to me kind of thing. Wow, 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 hmm, for sure. And I imagine, <laughs> I imagine from the parents' perspective, there are pros and cons to that too. But I think it's it's great. I think it's also teaching children to have their own opinions and perspectives um, yeah. and, and, and teaching them to be independent, to think for themselves. So I think, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, and I know that there is a lot of diversity in parenting, Whoa. but what is diversity in parenting to, to begin with for a lot of people who don't know that? No, no, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, it can be seen in sort of two ways, right? Um, and, and diversity sort of means like variety or many different things. And when I think about diversity in parenting, um, I think about Firstly, the diversity of the parent. So where the parent comes from, you know, are they uh, perhaps neurodivergent? Do they come from a different cultural background? Um, are they culturally diverse themselves? Um, and then the, this sort of impacts the, the family context, right? Uh, but, but also um, diversity in parenting can also relate to diversity of parenting approaches, for example, within the family, um, which perhaps also relates to the the diversity of the parent themselves. Um, so, yeah, I think it's sort of this, these two things that we can talk about diversity in parenting um, mm -hmm. from. Hmm. Hmm. I especially, I think, when you hear the word diverse, you hear it sort of one way, like, oh, you immediately hear cultural diversity and the yeah. whole different dynamics as to how cultural, cultural diverse parents really fit into and how culture fits into parenting. Cause I know that, um, cause I come from a mixed background. So I'm part Malay, but also I'm part New Zealander. Wow. So the different dynamics that sort of come to play in there, like there is some wow. one way of treating a grandparents with respect on that side of the family, uh -huh. but there's also another way where you could easily not talk to the rest yep. of that side of the family and, and it's it okay. being fine. Yeah, so, for sure. Mm. And I, I love seeing it from an outside perspective, especially because I'm not as close with my, um, with the Malay background of the family. So then when everyone's trying to discuss emotions, everything gets swept under the rug because there is no <laughs> discussion of emotions. There is no um, <sighs> saying how you feel. There's an out of respect kind of culture yep. that really comes into, yep. into play. Yep, so for sure. Amazing mm. on the other side, how you can easily oh, just wow. not talk to a cousin for a year, two years, and yeah. never sp see them again in family functions or never run into them or anything. So there's a whole lot of different dynamics that sort of play and the whole culture really fits into it. Cause I know Western culture is one way, Asian culture is completely the other way. For sure. Mm. And I love that you've just shared that too, Dina, because I totally relate <laughs> to, <laughs> to whatever you're saying. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you can tell, um, but I'm not from here. So I'm from Singapore, just okay. a, a neighboring country from, from Malaysia next to you guys. Um, but um, yeah, totally, you know, the, 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 you know, the way we relate to our parents and things like that, it's really different from, from here. Yeah. Yeah. So how does cultural diversity influence a lot of parenting styles that sort of come into maybe today's society mainly? Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think that um, for many of us, we, we learn about the world um, from our parents, um, who are the first people that, that we meet. Um, and I think the culture that we grew up in 
can really influence our view of the world, um, our hopes and expectations of family roles, what our children should do, what a parent should do, um, and, and relationships, and also what it means for our, our identity. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And how does that diversity fit in the family structure mainly? And how does that sort of a- change the way that parents approach parenting? Uh. Yeah. I think, um, I guess I have this unique position um, where I come from um, quite a collectivist culture. I grew up in a collectivist culture in Singapore um, where, you know, parents always have the last say. It's, it's about, you know, respect and authority. And, you know, if your parents say one thing, you try not to disagree because, you know, there might be um, repercussions uh, to that. Um, But I've also spent the last 10 to 11 years mainly in Australia and seeing a whole different side um, to how parents relate to their kids here too. Um, And, you know, there are parts of what I experienced here uh, that I wished I had growing up. But also, you know, there are parts where I'm like, I'm so grateful, you know, that I've learned some things from my own um, background as well. Um, But I say, I I think it it, it really impacts... um, how um, children see themselves um, as well. Uh, and I think it also impacts, I guess, you know, one of the examples that come, come, comes up for me quite frequently, you know, in, in, in some of the earlier years um, when, when I was in Australia, uh, is the difference uh, between um, the family structure and how um, uh, 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 children become independent. Uh, so in, 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 um, Asian cultures, or it, I can only speak from from my um, where I come from. Um, most people stay with their parents um, until they get married, even past eighteen. Most people, uh, whereas in Australia, you know, independence is really um, um, celebrated and encouraged. You know, there's almost a sense of you know when you're eighteen, you go get independent, and it's okay. it's it's good. It's a good thing. Um, um, with no sort of, and parents do not have any expectations of being largely involved. Whereas, you know, in our collectivistic society, you know, there is this expectation that parents are involved throughout your life in that sense. And if they're not, it's, it means something too. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. can definitely relate to that because <laughs> I grew up like throughout my childhood and going into yes. my teens and late teens, wow. I definitely experienced that kind of culture of like respect is just is being with your parents you can't live past you can't live outside of home until you're married and going that perspective and i grew up knowing that that's the way that my life was gonna go yeah when i hit about 22 so the last like few years or so i spent unlearning that structure Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. unlearning the whole idea of okay respect is given to those who respect you and if you're not heard then you don't have to hear them out Mm. and it's been such a huge eye-opener as to how much i've lost especially like career-wise they're like okay especially because i'm also coming from a muslim background so i have that idea of okay you get married very young and you get married at about 19 it's 19 20 21 that's the age you get married the minute that that didn't happen and i went past 21 i didn't know what my life was going to be past 21 Mm. and knowing i started so late into building a career and building my life and going to uni that i did not know what i was gonna be doing i had no idea what my life was gonna be because i always saw it as okay i'm gonna get married have kids yeah. and then my life is yeah. going to continue that way. There was this sort of story, this sort of path that's sort of been sort of paved for you. So of course, when it didn't happen, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, what do I do exactly. now? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So there was a huge mm. eye opener saying, okay, well, then I have to reevaluate how I'm going to be living my life. If I'm still going to be yeah. by myself after 21, or I'm still going to be living at home after this time. And the huge change in my mindset, especially I think COVID really helped in that change because I was at home thinking yeah. about what I wanted to do, thinking about yes. where I wanted to go. And 
that whole mindset shift was a huge thing in yeah. changing my role as as being the oldest daughter, as being the oldest sibling, as sort of taking care of being the only the only child that's like an oldest daughter feeling that's like it's just me and my sister. So yes. taking care of parents, taking care of like yeah. siblings was a change in dynamic for me. Because I had to grow up fairly quickly from after yeah. I was 21 and on for with sure. so there was a whole lot of change in them in my mindset as to how I'm going to be an adult and how I want my adult life to look like if it's not going to be what that picture was yes. going to be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I totally relate to that being the oldest um sibling um as well um with my younger brother. There's also the sense um um that you also very much take on the role as um a caregiver as well to to your sibling, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So and I wanted to know cuz I know this is going to come up a lot throughout the before we dive into the holiday season and how we're supposed to be around each other throughout the holidays I did want to know how can parents really promote a lot of inclusion and diversity within a family that can really assist their own parenting approaches so to make sure that all families members are heard to make sure that everyone sort of gets some say in their own life um, especially in a background that is very much situated in you have to do what I say kind of culture. Mm, mm. I love that question um, because it's sort of the sense of um, promoting diversity inclusion within the family. And I always believe that the family is the smallest unit in every society. And if, you know, if, if we can do that in the family, right, there are sort of ripple effects. So I love that question. And I think um, I think parents can pay attention to their sort of language use at home, how they talk about differences, you know, outside the home, you know, about, you know, um, people outside the home or, you know, um, people different from them. Um, but also taking a moment to ask themselves what they actually think about diversity and inclusion. Um, I think we can teach our, our, our kids, you know, about diversity and inclusion. You know, we should be accepting of people who, you know, are different from us. Um, but, you know, um, we all know that kids learn better through modeling, seeing what their parents do than what their parents actually tell them to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I think it's really about reflecting about what, what parents themselves actually think about diversity and inclusion. Um, how open are they to differences, their acceptance of differences and, and openness. Um, and, and that is sort of naturally um, exemplified in, 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 in their behavior, which their children um, will, will model. But also I think, you know, in terms of more practical um, uh, strategies in the home, I think books are a great way to, to promote diversity and inclusion. Um, so for children, you know, um, books like I think you know the other day I was in Kmart um, and I saw this book called um, The World Needs Who You Were Made to Be um, and I think it's by um, Joanna Gaines um, or something um, and it, it, it's a really lovely um, book on um, just accepting people as they are um, it, in a sense um, yeah yeah no I, I that's it's really interesting when we sort of say we model from we raise our kids to model what we do and they don't listen to what we say we we already know especially as teenagers they don't listen to what we say they don't listen to what adults say they have no care but they learn a lot from the actions that we do and I, i i love that because it's such a it sort of picks up the parents approach as well sort of say okay what my words are going to contradict what I say, what I do in real life. For example, if I say, oh, you can't go on your phone past nine, 10 o'clock because it's bad for you. Yep. And I'm suddenly on my phone past 11 o'clock and still hanging around on my phone, still wide awake. That's contradicting exactly what That's right. we've said our kids not to do. So that mm-hmm. behavior is also not going to be followed if they're following along with that bad behavior that we're setting ourselves up for. So it's really interesting. And I think especially when it comes to 
diversifying our lives and sort of making us a little bit more exposed. I love yeah. relying on books and I love how diverse books are getting in yes. today's day yes. and age. Yes. Because we're now so focused on, okay, this is what normal life looks like rather than this is what yes. stereotypical life right. would look like. Yes, yes, for sure. I, I, like you said, you know, I, I really resound with it um, because having different voices and different books and media, right, gives you the idea that, hey, you know, there's no one way to be human. Um, in fact, what we thought about that one way is just really putting us all into boxes. Um, and that's not really helpful for anyone because as humans, we're all diverse, whether we like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think everyone's, everyone's not the same as someone else, even if they're from no. the same background or similar background, there's not going to be the same career path that they choose. There's not going to be right. the same way that they live their life. And like, I love the way that we're saying about university nowadays as well, like how we're having that conversation as university is like simply one thing that parents want every kid to go through. Yeah. But there's that situation where as they get older, they realize that university isn't for them and they have to deal with the yeah. change of dynamics. Yeah. And it's such a big conversation between oh a parent and a child. And it's such a unique position when a child realizes what they want for themselves is not similar to what the parents want. And mm. I remember being in that headspace and understanding mm. that where my life is going is not exactly where my parents were wanting me to go or my grandparents yeah. were wanting me to go. And yeah. for me to choose media is such a, apparently to a lot of my grandparents is, it's not a That's reliable it. source of income. Yep. So, yep. Oh, freelancing is not, you're not earning money freelancing or you're not earning money in certain ways. But I honestly can't change their approach and understanding to things because that's how they understood the world. And that's how they yeah. understand the world. And how I understand the world is so different to how yeah. they do. Yeah. And when we talk about diversifying, like literally lowering different cultures, the way that I approach other cultures is so different to how my grandparents yeah approach cultures and they they have a lot more bias than I do now yeah. and yep. I now start calling them out on little behaviors oh, like good that on you. <laughs> I try to be respectful as I can be yeah but when they sort of like say something very direct and it's literally in front of someone else and it's in public I'm just like you shouldn't really say that yeah in public because yeah. it's yeah but I can't change their mindset no i've sort of understood that like i just have to know that that's the wrong mindset to be in yeah and that's as much as you can do that's right that's, that's right because the next generation mm, for sure and, and 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 like you were saying you know um you know um that's the best you can do you know you can only control your own behaviors and thoughts and beliefs um can't really change others but you can also try to like you were saying exactly. but that's all you can do yeah exactly no now, as the holiday seasons sort of come about, we're sort of, like I said a little bit earlier, we're always just stuck with each other during Christmas time or we're stuck during each other. <laughs> Kids are all at home, grandparents yeah. are visiting, there's a whole lot of commotion. How can pa parents really find that balance between the traditions that the family used to have and also adapting their own way of allowing the children to have some autonomy? throughout the holiday seasons? Yeah, no, no, um, that's a really good question. I imagine that comes up a lot um, as we, as we, you know, um, every holiday season, I imagine that comes up. Um, I think it is about um, communication um, and values um, as well. So for the parents, you know, your own personal values, when it comes to the holiday season, what's important, what's not important, that your own values will evolve um, as well. And that is the same for your partner, uh, if you're co-parenting or if you're married um, with your partner and your children as well. And I think having the conversation and a check-in, you know, every every time the holiday season comes up or every time there's sort of um, times where tradition happens, it's 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 good to have a check-in, even if it's briefly, just even, even if it seems sort of redundant. I think sometimes we might be surprised because we change all the time. 
um, and sort of just checking in, you know, is this still something we all enjoy um, in, in our family? Why or why not? You know, do people have, you know, different suggestions or maybe, you know, this year, you know, so-and-so doesn't feel like they, they want to participate in this particular tradition. Um, is there a way we can accommodate that that still meets everybody's needs? I think it's about communication, checking in and, and, and checking your maybe assumptions, um, perhaps. Um, yeah, yeah. Communication is probably the biggest thing, even throughout, even just without the holiday season, communication in a family is, it's, it's a big thing to ask for, I think also especially sort of taking out the mindset of, okay, this is how we're supposed to do traditions. And suddenly yes. my teenager wants to go and spend Christmas with their friends or spend or see their friends throughout Christmas no. or see their partner throughout Christmas. There's no. that whole other aspect of, okay, but this is our tradition. Christmas day is yeah. our day. And no. so how would you find that if a child sort of wants that autonomy to sort of be yes. with their partner throughout Christmas or spend a few hours with them. How would you find some, what would your advice be for parents who are sort of experiencing really? that sort of situation? I think my advice would be um, talking to, to, to the child. I think sharing about, you know, what's important to you with this particular thing, you know, being here for Christmas. Um, are there particular parts of this being here for Christmas that's more important to you than others? Are there ways that you can maybe compromise and give your child maybe um, some voice um, as well in this? You know, whether it, even if, you know, there's a sense that it's really important for you to be able to um, have them here for Christmas, is there things like, you know, maybe they can bring their partner along. That could be a compromise. They can still spend Christmas with their partner. Um, or maybe um, they might spend a couple of days with you and then a couple of days with their partner. I think involving um, the child in this decision making and also sharing your own feelings um, and thoughts around um, why this is important to you. I, I, I feel like teenagers can be quite understanding sometimes too. Um, <laughs> and, and I think I think sometimes you know we we assume that oh you know if we you know, sat down and, 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 and spoke to them um, to come to a compromise that they will definitely not see it from our perspective. Um, I don't know about that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like, I think I've seen a couple of movies where they sort of do it in a way that they spend Christmas morning with one family, but then they go to their partner's family and spend Christmas afternoon or Christmas oh. lunch there. Right. And that sort of really... Uh fits a compromise. However, we are talking about teenagers and there are that they don't have that grown up mindset of sharing Christmases. So there is that sort of dynamic where it does get difficult. And like I said earlier, parenting is very difficult, especially during this season. Yes. But yeah, this, sure. I think communication is probably one of the biggest things. And I'm so glad you brought that up because communication is so important between a teenager and mm. a child. I don't, I think two way communication is very, yes, especially important. Not one For way sure. saying this is what you're supposed to do, that you have to be here during this time, no, you have to be that's here. Right. Mm. It's, it's a mm. very different dynamic than saying, than being told what you're supposed to do rather than saying, okay. I would advise that maybe you do this and then maybe we can find some way for you to yes. also celebrate the way that you want to do it. That's right. That's right. And I, and I guess, you know, when I say, you know, sort of listening um, to children or teenagers, I, I don't just mean, you know, listening and doing everything that they say, but sort of letting them have some a voice or even some control over the situation. Because we all can relate to, you know, being teenagers and feeling like, you know, not having control over the situation. That that kind of sucks. Um, um, yeah, and I think it's sort of um, seeing if there are ways where, you know, maybe um, even if your kid has to spend time with you in, during this sort of Christmas period, are there ways that um, you can introduce some, um, um, allowing them some autonomy within those situations um, and flexibility maybe, yeah. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that's very important. And I, th I think having those conversations maybe like, I guess a month beforehand, sort of so you know where the boundary is, not like the day before, 
I think the <laughs> worst time to have a conversation is the day before a big celebration. Yes. <laughs> For sure. So yeah, maybe earlier on in the month or in December, have that conversation maybe. <laughs> Yes, 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 for sure. Earlier is better. Um, and it may be regular short conversations too. Like it's a conversation mm -hmm. that happens um, um, throughout the season, perhaps. Okay. But that could be good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so now we're going to go into our practice and habit part of the show. And this is some of the practices that you do, do or that you would usually recommend to a lot of your clients when going through similar situations. Oh, uh wow. -huh. Now, what would your recommended practice be to enhance their approach in promoting diversity in parenting to a lot of your children, to a lot of children? Uh, uh, uh. Um, in terms of um, practice, um, I do think that um, as cliche as it sounds, <laughs> it's about finding ways that work for you um, in sort of, understanding yourself um, and understanding sometimes the inherent biases or assumptions that you tend tend to make. I think oftentimes, you know, as human beings, we are evolved to make judgments, okay, quick judgments, um, because that, that is, that's important for our survival. And oftentimes our bias can be inherent. Um, and I think it's about slowing down, um, about reflecting, um, sometimes, and, and that can be done in many different ways. So some people, you know, journaling can be really helpful, you know, journaling their thoughts, um, slowing down, you know, what happened the other day, what was happening for me, um, um, checking their own assumptions um, and their own perspective on, on diversity um, and inclusion. Um, because, you know, like I was mentioning um, earlier, if you... Um, are continuously working on yourself in terms of being open to differences mm -hmm. and accepting um, of, 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 you know, um, including, you know, differences. Um, I think that that is the best way to promote diversity and inclusion in your children um, without um, directly doing it. And that benefits not just yourself, but your kids mm -hmm. and, and, and your family um, as well. Mm -hmm. hmm. And then that's... Yeah. That's some great advice, actually. I think just sort of focusing on looking at it from a different perspective and also talking with kids about how they would sort of see that situation. I think it's, for me, it was so important for me to understand how I saw things as a kid as well and sort of having to unlearn how I saw different different cultures, how I saw my different viewpoints as to what compared to what I grew up with and to compare yeah. to what I grew up understanding. Mm, and yeah. I wish that I got asked more often about how I saw things rather than this is how you're supposed to see things. Yeah. So I think mm. like if I could like jump on what you were saying, just sort yeah. of maybe say how how do you see this rather than saying rather than sort of like promoting by what they're doing, just sort of see where your child is at with how they see the world as well. And maybe try to find ways that you can correct it if need be, or try to find ways that they can enhance their view a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. I think that's so important. Um, checking in even with your kids about, mm -hmm. you know, how they saw, well, how they see certain things, um, giving them a voice um, and encouraging conversations like this. And I think, you know, one part of um, what came up for me as you were saying that is having the space to disagree as well. I think that's really important in a family. In fact, um, you know, in line with promoting diversity and inclusion, I think also um, promoting diversity in opinions that in, in, the, in itself, um, can really promote this diversity um, mindset um, as well, being open to differences. Um, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I honestly felt like I was very sheltered as a kid, not really, because I wasn't aware of a lot of the things in the world, a lot of situations sure. in the world. I also wasn't, I felt like I didn't care because it didn't involve me. So uh -huh. that was also a mindset that had to be changed as I got older, sort of just 
understanding history, understanding the world and understanding the different ways in which we've grown as a society was a big thing. So yeah, that yeah. was a big learning curve for me going into adulthood, having to sort of yeah. expand my knowledge on anything just than just myself, which was sure. a big thing. <laughs> no, no, I hear you. And I don't know if it's, um, um, it's got to do with the collectivistic sort of culture, uh, but I do also remember, you know, many times in my childhood feeling um, quite sheltered um, as well. And and as I sort of progressed, you know, in, in, into um, my, my, my teenager um, or adolescence, um, you know, finding myself questioning a lot of the things that I've been doing or taught the mm-hmm. thing that was right. Um, and, and, and when perhaps when I would sort of uh, gently challenge it a little bit. I, I, I would sort of have the sense of, oh, you know, we don't question these things, and and mm-hmm. and I think that was really that, that turning point of like, oh, but but why not? Why can't we challenge, you know, some of these things? Um, so yeah, being able to disagree, I think, um, yeah, can really facilitate, you know, that that, that learning too. Mm. Yeah, it's, it sounds a very similar background that we're, <laughs> we've both experienced. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Hmm. Now, um, oh, no, that's okay. No, that's fine. I I think it's it's important that we do challenge it. I think it's more important. It's more worrying, I think, if a child doesn't challenge it or doesn't ask why this is yes. or doesn't ask questions. Boom. Because then that shows that they don't have a lot of care for it, which is also very sad, especially if they don't understand why something is the way that it is or why people are different from you or what makes someone else different for you or why someone's life is a lot more difficult. If they don't challenge that, then if they don't ask why that is, then I think that's that's something a lot of parents, I think, should really question a little bit more. For sure, yeah, for sure, and and encourage those. Um, I think it's also tricky sometimes these conversations and uncomfortable too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I so think I can totally I understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can totally understand. Um, and I feel uh, too for for those yeah conversations. So yeah. So now we're going into the last section of our show, which is the open mic. Now, this does give you a chance to talk about anything that you are passionate about or something that you feel the audience really should know. Um, And I think we spoke about this a little bit before the show and a little bit throughout. And it is the going through the neurodivergent and mainly in autism and mainly in the late diagnosis of autism. And now Mm -hmm. I'm also really fascinated in this. Anytime someone brings it up, I sort of geek out to it a tiny bit. (laughs) And we, it's such a big, big topic. And uh, for a lot of people who don't really know, um, could you give a general overview as to what being late diagnosed with autism and how that sort of affects a lot of people in their life now? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I've been seeing, you know, um, over the last, you know, say, I would say two to three years that there has been this sort of increase um, in um, adults um, getting a late diagnosis of autism and or um, ADHD, being neurodivergent themselves. Um, And a lot of um, these clients um, come from a really unique perspective where perhaps they have grown up feeling really different. Um, but not really knowing why they never really felt like they fit in. Um, I've also heard of some, you know, clients who have said that, you know, sometimes they felt really defective or they tried really hard to be like their peers, but it never really worked out. And, and that really, um, you know, they really hit on their sort of self-esteem and how they saw themselves. Um, and they really struggled through life feeling like they've often had to work much harder than other people to achieve the same things, but never really knowing why. Um, And when they, you know, get this diagnosis, it's sort of this sense of, oh my goodness, everything in my life sort of makes sense. But also there's this sort of almost, would I say, dilemma in that sort of like everything in my life makes sense and there's this relief. But also, I wish I could have known this much earlier because I would have been less hard on myself for all the things that I felt like was 
wrong about me. Yeah. 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 No, I mm. think it's it's mm. such an incredible topic mm. because my sister mm. is on the wait list currently to be diagnosed for autism. Yeah. Yeah. And she's going through that process of it's a, it's a long waiting list. So especially after COVID, I think the length of that list has increased probably double as what it used to be because of yeah. everyone just sort of noticing little things here and there that sort of make them feel like they're a little bit different and they see the world a little bit for differently. Sure. And sure. there's, mm -hmm. it's such a big conversation that we're having now in terms of you not noticing it throughout high school and throughout being a teenager and a child. And a lot of, I found out recently that a lot of people don't really realize it and sort of think that that's the normal way that people are supposed to behave yeah. until they realize that they were and it all makes sense. And it's such an amazing thing to sort of see. And I was watching a few videos on that recently as well about mm. people who are sort of going through that conversation of, this is things that I've recently realized that made me autistic. And there were a lot of things there that so many people in the comment section were so relating to. And it made yeah. them wonder if that's the case as well. And that's right. I think the way that we see autism now is so different than what it used to be. Yeah. And like the way that we see that we used to see it is extreme extents. And that's sort of what made you a what we saw as being autistic, um, not yes. being able to function every day. No. But there are people who are functioning every day and still have autism. And that's what we that's right. didn't notice yet. That's right. And and those are often the people that fell through the cracks because often they're better at what we call masking or camouflaging um, the sense of putting on a mask. Um, to to um, to fit in, uh, and to some extent, um, you know, we all do that. But for neurodivergent individuals, that actually takes a huge toll or a bigger toll um, on 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 their mental health. Um, yeah, mm. yeah. No, it's it's such a big mm. topic, and I honestly wish that we could have a whole other hour to talk about it because <gasps> I know it's such an interest of mine to really just do research here and there or see articles here and there about yes. different ways that like I I get so interested in the fact that this is how everyone sees the world and this is how yes. and we talk about diversity that fits in perfectly with what it does the the diverse view that between parents and children and that can cause a whole lot of arguments because one child sees the world in one way but doesn't know that they're seeing it in a neurodivergent way or that's right. parents not really mm -hmm. understanding that that's aspect no. as well. That's and no. parenting is a big thing in itself, but parenting someone who you don't know is neurodivergent with either ADHD or autism, there's yep. a whole other things. And yeah. I think parents now are having to change their view as how they see autistic kids or how they see kids with ADHD. And For sure maybe helping the child not to mask it as a whole lot more is a big thing. And yeah, it's, it's a scary, it's scary to think that your child is going through life, not really knowing and you not knowing that they are right. neurodivergent as well, unless they go and get that test for it or go get tested out. Yeah, and for sure. And, and imagine not knowing this about your child and from the child's perspective, being like, oh my gosh, why do I feel like I'm wrong all the time? And from the parents' perspective, like, why do I feel like I'm wrong all the time? And there's sort of complexity, isn't it? And okay. I, as I'm sort of listening to, to you talk, you know, what comes up for me too is sort of that dynamic of, you know, um, a neurotypical parent, you know, maybe trying parent neurodivergent kid without knowing that they're neurodivergent themselves. Or um, maybe a parent um, who has a neurodivergent kid that they both do not know uh, are neurodivergent. Yeah, that they can add to that complexity too, I, I imagine. Oh God, just just that a whole generation of masking, of like parents masking, children masking, yeah. and that's how they normally see the world. It's such a uh the amount of the amount of times that we can easily just go ahead and keep talking about this is is fascinating. But thank I you know. so much for that <laughs> overview and for helping a lot of parents maybe see a little bit of a, another perspective as to how neurodivergent isn't what you sort of think it is or autism isn't yes. what 
you think it is. So, you know, right. thank you so much for that. And I do want to say thank you for joining me on the show today. I think it was such a great conversation. And I, I love how much we sort of related to a lot of what we were talking about today and right. just having that deep view of both perspectives. I think both cultures are very important to sort of mention and know, and I know there's so many other cultures that sort of deal with differently. And I know that we can't, I can't really say it from my perspective because I don't know those cultures that well or directly, yep. but I know that there's so many out there that sort of have similar ways of how they interpret it, what we're talking about today. So For I sure. definitely want to acknowledge and acknowledge that. Um, but Sarah, if there's a way that audiences, audience members will want to find more of your work or find some of your other practices, other things that you're going through, um, that you're interested in, other ways that they can find out a little bit more? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, they can find me on LinkedIn or I'm also on um, Instagram, um, which I can sort of send through um, my, my handle and link to you guys and you can sort of link it um, oh, in, 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 your, in your podcast description or something. That's totally fine. No, that's perfect. I'd, I'd love to do that. I, I love sort of sharing a lot of people's work. And I think that's why I love this show so much is the fact oh. that there are so many different academics here that we really do need a bit more perspective on, especially in this day and age when everyone's perspective really counts. So yeah, thank you so much for joining me on the show, Sarah. It was so great having you on and talking with you and discussing a lot of the similarities that we had. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Oh, no, it was lovely. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I, I've loved, you know, talking to you about all the, all my interest areas, but also, you know, our relating um, on, 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 the, on the level uh, um, in terms of our childhood experiences um, with, with parenting and family and things like that. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love relating to guests. It's so, it's so much easier oh. when you sort of find that balance as well, which is it is so nice. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you all in the next episode. You've been listening to All Together, the Family Science Insights Podcast, produced by the Family Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 Life Management Perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people find it so that we can grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at fa.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent. Thanks for tuning in.